So this is Terry Molner and Wayne Silby, and we're, we're here to tell you about the story of the founding of the Calvert Group and then the Calvert Social Investment Funds and what we learned along the way uh, that we think could be helpful to you when you're thinking about starting your business or selling your business. So why don't we start, Wayne, with you telling the story of how you and John Guffey came together and created the Calvert Group. Sure, uh, undergraduate buddy uh, John Guffey and I uh, uh, had an idea for uh, a way to do cash management, uh, a money market fund. And this is when there were only a couple money market funds in the country and we had a way to structure it so it would also be the highest yielding and the safest. And uh, so on a shoestring we basically uh, started that and it uh, mushroomed enormously because uh, we were the highest yielding and safest uh, money fund in the country and within a few years we were over a billion dollars in assets and this is 30 years ago and we were kind of young and uh, that uh, kind of was at a time when uh, you, know, you didn't have the good luck so quickly like that. But what happened, Terry, is before we got involved with the Calvert Social Investment Fund was you and I somehow met at a conference center about some values-based thing and you invited was, me into uh, Community Center? Economics, uh, Institute for Community Economics. It was uh, called Another Place Farm, I right. think. Mark Sarkady was right. uh, uh, advising that. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, why don't you say a little bit about that? <clears throat> well, first of all, Wayne's been a little too shy. I think you were about 27 years old. And, um, and he did some brilliant things that I think are just worth pointing out about starting a business. Um, you first identified a couple of people on Wall Street, I think, that were uh, responsible for moving the variable rate below $50 million mortgages off into the marketplace. And you realized that that would give you the, 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 the first all-government variable rate money market fund, which would be a very high performance. Right, we started the variable rate movement conceptualizing with the Small Business Administration and uh, after we did that, we also hired a fellow who wanted to retire on Wall Street at age 40 and wanted to retire to a farm in Vermont. And he would call in the trades to his buddies on the street. Uh, and uh, we were also then the highest yielding uh, tax-free uh, funds in, in the country. So we were, uh, I mean, the growth was happening very fast and, you know, dozens and then tens and tens of dozens of employees. And pretty soon we were up to a couple hundred people. Right and uh, doing well, and then I met you, and so, then... So Wayne, Wayne and I met at another place farm, which was this place that a whole lot of the, frankly, hippie community of New England gathered on weekends. And Wayne and I met each other, and it was because Mark Sarkin, he said, hey, there's another guy here who knows something about money, which was you. So Wayne and I met, because I was involved with Bob Swan. We'd started the Institute for Community Economics. And the focus of the Institute of Community Economics was to do three things, to deal with uh, community land trusts, um, alternative currencies, and alternative investment, we called it then, which became social responsible investment. <clears throat> I took responsibility for bringing about 20 people together who were socially responsible people from around the country uh, to help put together what became the first social screens, and I invited Wayne to be part of that group. So we'd get together up in, in Cambridge every month for over a year, and we'd, I'd write up these social screens that we created, and then we'd regurgitate them and re rewrite them and do this mm -hmm. every month. And then at the, um, uh, the whole thing was going along, and then something very wonderful happened. Wayne called me up and just was talking to me about it and said, listen, why don't I fly up there tomorrow, and you and I will spend a morning and an afternoon, we'll think this through and see where we, how we take it to the next step. Because at that time, the plan was that we were going to get foundations to put money in to help do this uh, SBIC and make loans to, to community investments in these kinds right, of Right, kind of, and here I'm doing mutual funds right. and uh, also having uh, uh, Robert Zevin was part of that uh, group uh, right. who was with the U.S. Trust and uh, we thought, gee, why don't we create a, a mutual fund that maybe has some of these screens and that was reinforced by this conference center, by the way, that had this conference on right livelihood, which right. is a Buddhist uh, principle of how do you integrate the values in your life. And I can remember at the conference thinking, gee, you know, our business is getting an extra eighth or a quarter percent more than the next guy, and this is what my life is kind of about. This is how we do things. And uh, thinking about, you know, is that what you want on your gravestone, whatever. And at the same time, being this new uh, baby boomers that were sort of coming of age, I would call it more post-hippie than hippie, mm -hmm. and uh, saying, well, how do I integrate the values? So 
How do we make investments where the, all the investments stand for what we believe? And we don't just make money over here and then go to church on Sunday and give here. And uh, I think that that whole confluence of uh, factors uh, led to us and Mark Sarkey and Grace LeClaire, who was mm -hmm. at the conference center, uh, kind of inspiring uh, uh, people who showed up for a vision that uh, Terry and I had been uh, uh, let, cooking up. Let me throw in one story, which I think could be very valuable, because this happens to people in their lives, what happened to Wayne and me. When Wayne came up that day, <clears throat> after lunch, we took a walk in the park. While we were walking along in the park, I said to Wayne, I had a professor in college named Ken Blanchard. He later wrote the book, One Minute Manager. And Ken used to always say, if you want to have people learn something, try to sell them something because they pay attention when you're deciding, when they're deciding whether or not to buy something. At which point, Wayne stopped on the path, turned to me and said, well, if that's the case, rather than raise the money from foundations, we should set up a mutual fund where any individual could invest $1,000 and a lot more people would learn a lot more about these ideas. At that point, Wayne's and my eyes met. And it's one of those moments that happen for other people in their lives where you have this sense of a, a moral imperative, like, oh my God, that's something we could do. And we had this sense that was something we well, could do for our generation. No. Especially because we, you know, I had the mutual, I had the lawyers, I had everybody right. uh, uh, ready to uh, right. manifest this. but. You and Mark and others pulled together in this amazing advisory council. That's right, that's right. I mean, I, I will say a vision is important, but a vision that can pull together the wonderful people who make the wonderfulness and the execution happen, I think is really what uh, Calvert was about that continued to inspire us in terms of uh, principles to be the first comprehensively screened fund. And Terry, back in 1982, people thought we were strange when well, we tell some Wall Street people and others that we were going to do a fund based on uh, social values. It was, uh, it was uh, not... Well, well, not only that, different. let's tell the other wonderful, delightful story. So Wayne makes, makes a phone call and says, let's do it as an extension of the Calvert Group. I said, great. So we began to do all this, and we got Mark Sarkady to be responsible for Create a the advisory. Board advisory for it. We yeah. got Grace to end up being the first person on it. But the reason Grace became the first person is because Wayne and his partner John took this idea to your management committee and tell us how your management committee responded. <laughs> well, uh, we, uh, you know, we're using the, we were actually kind of doing a lot of management consulting that we brought in and empowerment and so on. So I took it to my management committee and uh, I told them about this idea and how we ought to. And then uh, first I took it to my partner uh, and said, John, I'm a little bit, and then I said, and John, if I don't get this, I'm going to throw the biggest tantrum you ever saw. And I think it is important, Terry, in the sense that, you know, sometimes you feel passionate about a vision that is very different, it's transforming, it's out of the box, and uh, there's just some times in life when you have to stand up and say, uh, we're going we're gonna to do this anyway. And, uh, you know, I, I promised the management team I would not pull another one like that uh, more than once a year. There are two things that I want to have Wayne tell us about. <clears throat> One of them was that they, he very cleverly not only put together the, the variable rate uh, securities to buy that ended up with them being the number one performing all government money market fund for the first couple of years. Actually, a high, uh, of all money funds. Of all, even, of all money funds. Not just government. Not yeah. just government funds. Ooh, that's even more important. And um, that there were two things that he did that I thought were really clever. And this is the kind of things that smart business people just find a way to do. He first went in offices at 1700 Pennsylvania Avenue, which gave you a pre very prestigious address, like across from the White House. It was the and Xerox room of a law firm. But there you we go. We rented it. <laughs> and then the second thing that he did is you put these small ads, I think like two inches by three inches, in the three newspapers, the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, and the Washington Post, I think. <clears throat> and over the next couple of years, people mailed to that address a billion dollars. Yep. Okay. So that's just the kind of clever things that you can think about that are this distinguishing things that make a difference. Okay, now let's go to the social responsible mutual funds. So um, you ended up having your management uh, agree to go along with you to allow you to do this as your kind of special project. So then you hired Grace, mm -hmm. Grace mm -hmm. LeClaire, as the special person. And tell how Grace handled this thing in the first. Well, Grace was quite a, a talker in terms of uh, being able to talk with the press and distill imagination, also articulate the values. She was a, uh, uh, come from a long Quaker tradition. Uh, she also came from a 
actually, you, you know, she was thrown out of uh, Columbia University as the for good reasons for uh, <laughs> off-campus <laughs> student, uh, student alliances, yes, but right. that was a '60s uh, incident. Yeah. But anyway, she uh, uh, she held uh, she was kind of the the birth mother of holding the values. I mean, I was still managing many of these other things, and. Uh, Mark Sarkady played a key role in getting the advisory council right. together. But also people like, uh, people brought different skills and Terry kept thinking about the uh, underserved and the kind of the grassroots opportunities for many of our investments, the community investments we did. And uh, yeah, of course we had others that are in technology or other kinds of, so it, it, it just, gr a lot of great people showed up for this okay. and a uh, real privilege for me to right. have been well, a So promoter. I still remember when you, Robert Zevin and I sat in his office to put together the incorporation of the, of the, mm -hmm. of the company and we had the discussion about that we wanted to do something. So from the very beginning we were committed to do something to end poverty. And I remember I argued for more like 10% of the fund and, and then of course the money managers would say, oh, you know, that's, my, that's my reputation, that, that uh, performance. And so we ended up putting in, though, that we could do up to, uh, what do we say, 5% or something? No, it's 1% or 2%. Yeah, 1% or 2%. But the important thing is there no other mutual fund in the history of the United right. States had this provision right. where we would take part of our money and invest it at a below market uh, rate of return, uh, which has been 3%, and that's been a terrific program in so many respects. In fact, currently the markets are down. Uh, in fact, currently we, we made 3% a year for the last 10 years on that portfolio which is better than the rest of our portfolio because of the market right. exigency. So doing the right thing oftentimes right. Uh, right. Uh, has the financial performance too. But okay, so that's good. So <clears throat> we have a lot to tell here. So then we started the social funds and Grace was a great voice. She became the voice of this. And we thought it would take us like five years to get the $30 million to break even as I recall. And South Africa issue took off. And the students were demonstrating on the campuses. And lo and behold, we were the only mutual fund that was not investing in South first, Africa. First uh, fund not to yeah. do South Africa. Yeah. So suddenly we became a cause celeb. So over the next years, we got 20, 30 articles every month in newspapers and magazines all over the, all over the country. A lot of press. A lot of press, and Grace had a lot to do with it. It was different. She, it was a yeah. new kind of way of thinking. And fortunately, Terry, when we look here and we're at this other conference, I mean, uh, this whole idea of sustainable society has now become more mainstream when back then you were really, you know, people thought you were still on drugs when you uh, <laughs> talked about What, am I, uh, what do you mean about me? <laughs> so, <laughs> so anyway, the, the important thing is that we started the social funds within a year and a half or so, I think we were at 30 million mm -hmm. and we were at break even and it took off. And then as people remember, the stock market took off in 1982, and a lot of money began to move out of money market funds into the stock market. And it was the social funds that were gaining assets, right, which were very Paris important at that point. It was also the same time, and getting into the selling and without selling out, that the banks were allowed to compete. And Calvert Explain was that. 90%, 95% in the traditional investments. So, uh, and we had a couple hundred people at this time, and my partner and I did some really deep soul searching. Some people approached us and said they would like to uh, buy us and, uh, you know, have a life with them. And since uh, I think the first month we saw maybe 20%, 25% of our assets go out the door and we just had all this new overhead and people. Yeah. So uh, we uh, uh, made the decision to uh, um, uh, uh, sell to them affiliate. I mean, we still ran our, our shop. In fact, one interesting aspect of the selling without selling out was that, again, the social funds were a new phenomenon. A lot of people were just, didn't see the future there. And uh, we were allowed to keep our own board members on that fund, whereas uh, the other funds had more of a traditional mentality and board structure uh, of the Calvert funds. So the Calvert social funds had their own People like Rebecca Adamson was also instrumental in the community investments and uh, Sidney Morris, Sydney who, Morris. Uh, was a, a, who was a preacher at Harvard Divinity School and just a, anyway, wonderful yeah, we, people. We had, you want to say more? Well, so we sold and yet we kept control of the boards in terms of the social funds, which were very tiny then compared mm -hmm. to everything mm -hmm. else. And it allowed us to try some innovation, experimentation there. And also, uh, we, we had created a Calvert Foundation, 
rather small at the time, but another way to continue to express the values of attaching uh, values to the investment process. And now, Calvert Foundation, and right. you're on the executive well, there, committee. Is yeah, right. But let's 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 just bring a couple things in here that are important. That, that are important. One is that <clears throat> in the mutual fund industry, there's many interlocking corporations in a way. And so the Social Responsible Investment Fund was its own corporation. And mutual funds don't usually have staffs. They sign a contract with a management company. Right. And the management company is, runs everything. So when the insurance company that bought Calvert bought the management company, they thought they controlled the board of the mutual funds because they really didn't understand mutual funds all that well. And so then a year later, a lawyer shows up in our board meeting basically to let us know that they thought they were controlling the funds and they realized we're kind of independent cusses and that they don't control, really basically control us. And we said, uh, yeah, is there anything else you want to talk about? <laughs> so to this day, the board of the social funds is, a, is still very committed to the mission. And we have uh, a contract with management committee and we negotiate once a year to make sure that the management committee is fulfilling the, the, the social mission as well as the financial mission of the social investment funds. Yeah, I would say that. I would, however, I would also say that uh, management, and, and we have a, a woman CEO, and right. I know that uh, uh, in terms of, of uh, you know, women on our board, and women's issues became uh, a uh, kind of a, uh, a, stock, a stocking for the, for the funds. We've done a lot of interesting things there in terms of writing our 500 uh, companies about when they knew boards, boards of directors, do they have a diversity clause and do they consider? So that was a lot. Some of us wanted to do a little more of the grassroots. So as with any organization, sometimes there's, uh, there's people who want to innovate in one way and people who want to uh, push certain uh, 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 principles. So I think that uh, uh, management, and just management in any corporation just wants to, I shouldn't say that, just, Selling, profits, very mm -hmm. important. And what we do at Calvert, we do with integrity in terms of a screening and, and the, uh, you know, the mm -hmm. high impact program, our special equities program. You know, at the same time, the entrepreneur is always like, sometimes the glass is half empty. Oh, we should be more politically involved here. Mm -hmm. We should be doing this. And uh, I think that if I have some regrets, I feel like there are additional ways that on a grassroots basis, we. We, 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 we could have innovated, and it, you know, since you own the company, you don't care about the profits, uh, but we didn't own the company anymore. And uh, you know, it's kind of that right uh, tension and, and balance of uh, making sure you're, you're, you're uh, you know, doing to the uh, senior uh, shareholders uh, uh, the money, but also keeping aligned with the mission and doing what you say, which we, we do do. So I would say to people, uh, uh, we had a rather unique circumstance right. of being right. able to keep a certain uh, pathway, but at the same time, even that pathway, personalities and people and agendas, you can't do everything, uh, uh, showed up. So uh, I, um, I, I, I put a lot of energy in our foundation now, which right. has right. been exactly. very successful. Yeah. And Let, let's, cap, let's catch people up on a couple things. So the Calvert Social Investment Funds were launched in uh, 1982, in October, <clears throat> and then they took off. Uh, and they grew, and today the assets are something like five billion plus. Um, Pox World was in existence before us, but we were the first fully diversified uh, set of so comprehensive screen. social screens, mm -hmm. and the first family of social responsible mutual funds. And I think we're still the largest family of social responsible mutual funds. And so the whole thing grew, and we became very committed to shareholder activism. We're one of the strongest companies that does shareholder activism in the country, and we team up with lots of other people. Um, Barbara Krumsick, our CEO, became a champion of women's principles, which became another very, very important thing. Where Some Dell United and Nations, many people, right? We, we right. were very supportive right. in uh, enabling that. That's right. And so we took on a lot of social issues and became a part of the community. And so people would come to us. One of the things I'm proudest of is when we, when the Darfur issue came up, and the group that was uh, responsible for creating the whole movement about saving Darfur and caring about. Darfur. Um, we didn't have any investments in Darfur, but we realized that by adding our name to the movement, we could be helpful to them. And so um, um, Bennett, mm -hmm. uh, the head of our social research department, made a, a coalition with them, and we have been very helpful to them when we didn't even have any investments in their country. And usually, we've only got involved with issues where we have investments. Well, ben Bennett Freeman, actually, in the Clinton administration was a uh, 
uh, was a, uh, a, um, in the Secretary of State's office and Office of Human Rights. So it was a very strong passion that's issue right, for him. Right, and he's, you know, there at Calvert, and here comes a really strong human rights issue. And yes, we were able to facilitate a number of conversations and have companies more aligned around some Darfur principles. So then one of the other things that, that all of us on the board began to realize that we could do was to set up a foundation. Now, in 1988, this is one of my little stories, is that I always wanted to have us get involved with doing something in poverty. Mm -hmm. And so um, during the 1980s, it was very clear that it would not be strongly supported by the people managing our money. Then in 1988, there was an article about Muhammad Yunus on the bottom half of the business section of the New York Times on we Sunday. We should mention, though, that uh, I had met Yunus and invited him to join our exactly. board. So exactly. he was on our board for a number well, of years. Yeah, that hadn't happened yet, but, mm -hmm. but that did happen. But the point I'm getting at here is that when I saw that article, I said, it's time. Social responsible investment has been established, and it's now time for us to do something about ending poverty. So then we went to the board, and we got uh, the board to, remember, the, we allocated $250,000, and I made loans to, to 10 different mm -hmm. uh, groups of $25,000. But it started our high social impact program, mm -hmm. where we were making loans to, um, where we'd have a big social bang. So we began to say, you know, we should have shareholder meetings. So we had shareholder meetings in San Francisco and Boston, I think. And we brought it up to our shareholders, you know. So hundreds of people showed up for our shareholders meeting. And I remember Wayne got up and said, so we want to do this thing of, you know, having you prove that up to 1%, you know, we would be able to make, you know, a below market rate. Which you know, then was millions and millions of dollars. Millions of dollars, yeah. right? And we thought that they'd think it was kind of scary. They said, no, do more, do more, do more. I lost so control we, of the audience. Yeah. <laughs> But, uh, and so we then ended up doing the high social impact, and then it became reasonable to move it into the foundation. Mm -hmm. So in the early 1990s, your partner, John Guffey, and I, I remember, spent most of the mm -hmm. 90s working with the foundations to set up the Calvert Foundation and get it approved. And so today, the Calvert Foundation has $250 million that it manages. We're growing at something like a million, million to $2 million of new assets a month. Uh, the investors buy a community investment note where they get to choose their interest rate between 0 and 3%. The average cost of our money is, what, 2.29%. And we loan the money out at 4%, usually. And Microfinance groups, low-income community groups. And I think, Terry, the most interesting story, this being uh, April uh, 2009, when Citibank and P banks are collapsing all over because of uh, right. their loans, we are still not experiencing loan problems because we made loans to people, poor people, to buy houses they could afford, uh, not something a Wall Street salesman could uh, flip. And this is, I feel like, the, demonstrating the, a values-based approach to finance actually is the best way to uh, work with finance. And that we're, we're thinly capitalized, we're not regulated, we're not insured, and yet people are giving us more money. And uh, I mean, it's, we're sort of a victim of having done a good job. We, well, we, uh, we, should, we should point out that yeah. because of a, we're a tax organization, we're exempt from securities laws. So that's why we don't have to do the registration. The other thing that I want to point out is that we've met people here at this conference, Wayne. We're not the only organization having the experience we're having. The other organizations making loans to low-income housing groups and microloan programs around the world are not having the kind of anywhere near significant no, increase in yet. default rates. Right. Mm -hmm. That's really important because it shows that if you do things the way we do them with yeah, the social consciousness, and, this mm -hmm. flim-flam stuff that's happened through Wall Street is mm -hmm. not happening. So, so now let's think of um, what are the things that if we could have done differently, what would we have done differently? In hindsight, what would we have done differently? Well, I think it would have been possible to actually keep the social funds off to the side. I don't think the uh, insurance company particularly wanted them, and that would have given us a little more breadth in terms of uh, activity. Um, but I will say that uh, uh, I, I feel like sometimes uh, I would like to foster more grassroots movement. And, you know, corporations, they tend to be more corporate. Uh, and uh, at the same time, as I say, uh, you know, working the, the delicate balance, I, I know I made one proposal at Calvert after we sold that they didn't go for. And I wanted us to take all this wonderful info. We have a department of 20 people, and all they do is research companies and social issues. 
about uh, you know how they you know Xerox isn't a community citizen or labor or environment or how there were sweatshops in China. I mean, we have a treasure house of information. I wanted us to uh, make that more publicly available, and uh, management thought that that's kind of their intellectual property, and uh, uh, that uh, you know people may not buy the funds if they can do it to so do that research. But we have a, a wonderful uh, trove of research. So that was one. Uh, 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 I guess that was my major uh, suggestion that uh, uh, they didn't. Uh, uh, well, and, and so you know, you, you, and, you and I and John Guffey to some degree were were entrepreneurs at heart. So Wayne and I and John are always coming up with new and wonderful ideas, and they don't fly too easily inside a system that's not. Well, and right. also it's easy to come up with ideas and the execution. Yes, that's true is, too. So that's true. we get a, we're riding a little. We're doing some free riding here. That's uh, true. That's true. Uh, because, uh, uh -huh. uh, but the. The most exciting thing I think that you and I feel most thrilled about at this point is that the foundation is growing like crazy and we're helping so many people on every continent on the planet. We have loans out to over 257 different nonprofit organizations mostly around the world that are making these micro loans and low income housing loans. Uh, <clears throat> is there anything else, if, if I think of anything we do different, I don't come up with anything else. I, don't, I come up with it. It would have been nice if we could have had the social funds been separate and we could have kept running those and mm -hmm. it would have been nice if we could have uh, had some of our more wilder ideas given a try at times. Um, in your heart, if you're talking to people who have, uh, uh, are going to be ended up having their companies end up owned by somebody else, what's the main thing that you think that you'd like to let them know from your experience? Well, I could say trust in Allah, but tie your camel, <laughs> old Arab expression. <laughs> But uh, no, I think that you know the corporate. There's a drift when you're young and excited. The passion forces, but an organization can drift towards the money and the profit. And I think we uh, have done a very good job uh, at Calvert. When we do say we're doing certain things, I feel we do them with real high integrity and quality, and that I'm uh, very pleased with. Uh, but I do think to people who are uh, essentially selling their companies and, and still trying to hold on to a mission or a vision. Uh, just th there is this strong cultural drift. You don't, it isn't in, in one person. It's in a kind of a mentality of drifting towards the convention. And uh, you have to uh, work on that uh, in terms of you sell your company. One way you might do it, as I think we did, we kind of kept our skunk works more in the That's foundation. Right. Right. And so we're kind of having our fun there and yeah. doing some very different yeah. and innovative yeah. kinds of uh, activities there. Yeah. And, you know, the foundation, uh, the funds invest and get these yeah. notes as well, so the, the funds benefit. And we also uh, are here at a conference where we're one, again, of the only mutual fund I know of makes uh, investments into direct small public companies like, uh, uh, you know, companies we've seen here uh, that are, uh, um, you know, five, ten people have a vision and they need some money and we join with others to uh, create this social venture capital activity. So uh, we're able to, uh, I think, you know, do the good work and I think creating the space and the room and the vision, if you sell your company, for how you can continue to, to do that good work, but you're gonna need your, your kind of your skunk works or some control there because, you know, there's gonna be a, a drift uh, and uh, just, uh, uh, plan for that would be my uh, advice. The thing that I think I'd like to say that I learned from our experience at Calvert is this. We're all in this together. And at any one moment, you're in a particular spot in a particular time. And what we want to do is to respond to what's in front of us as best as we can. We ended up in a situation at Calvert where we no longer own the management company, but we control the mutual fund. So we have spent the last 20 years doing what we could do from that position to move the agenda forward. Uh, and so the thing I think I'd like to say is, you never know what kind of situation you're going to end up in. But whatever situation you end up, if you're, if you're on the cutting edge of being a player and making the world a better place, you're having fun, and that's what you can do from that spot. And then you can think about what you can do in the next moment that might be different. But we ended up in a unique situation, and we made it beautiful. I would say we were uh, blessed with uh, a platform that allowed yeah. us to explore yeah. some additional edges and be a part of a society that was yeah. growing and changing. And now with you know the real change with Obama 
and uh, some of those policies. But also I have to say, Terry, when you work on some of these uh, uh, kind of higher end concepts, you meet great people like you and have a lot of fun. <laughs> and that has been, uh, that, that, that is big. Thank you all.